uh, my name is Richard. Um, I'm the CTO of Opsian. Uh, we make low overhead continuous profiling tools. Um, though this talk isn't really a product pitch as such, it's more a general discussion of kind of performance methodology and things around that. So we're going to be talking about what I mean about kind of fantastic performance and where to find it and what I kind of consider kind of performance work versus kind of regular development and architecture and things like that. Then I'm going to give a few examples of kind of profiling certain types of performance problems on my laptop and we'll see how that kind of information pops up and appears in a profiler and look at uh, a kind of a newer visualization for profiling data called flame graphs. And then we're going to talk about how we kind of apply these ideas in a more real world setting. So not just uh, a laptop with a tool there, but how we can look at real production systems and solve real problems and make actual customers happy. So, Firstly, you know, fantastic performance. What do I mean by that in the title? Obviously, everyone uses fancy titles in their talks in order to try and attract the attention of audience members. But there's perhaps a more kind of realistic uh, concept behind fantastic performance here, which is performance that meets our business objectives. It sounds a lot less sexy and less exciting if you phrase it that way, but it's kind of the more important thing, right? Keeping your customers happy. You don't want customers sitting around waiting ages for things like web pages to load. You don't want to be spending a lot of money on infrastructure costs necessarily, especially in the cloud where everything under the sun is metered, measured, and something you pay for. And you also want to have systems that can scale out. So we don't want to have scalability bottlenecks within our, our system as such. So that's what I mean by fantastic performance. And when you start talking to people about uh, performance, especially at conference talks. Maybe that's a, a bit of a biased perspective for me myself. You see people giving you these big, fancy architectural visions, right? Full of exciting buzzwords. Reactive, cloud native, microservices, blah, 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 blah. Now, I don't want to say there's anything wrong with these technologies as such, but often when um, both with Optium, when we have customers using our tool, and also when I've done some consulting work for people beforehand, you find that if people have got an existing working system, the best value for money, the most kind of utilitarian approach, is to take that existing system and measure what's going on, find bottlenecks, and iteratively fix and, re and resolve those bottlenecks in order to improve the performance. Not to engage in a kind of big bang rewrite with all the latest fancy technology, which often has the kind of same success rate as invading Russia in wintertime. Not a good plan, right? So when people say, OK, cool, but I want a big benefit, and you say, well, you know, you can often get, if you've got a load of low-hanging fruit in your application, you can frequently get 10x improvements in throughput just from a bit of profiling and rewriting and tweaking of existing systems. And you can take systems that were completely unusable for their customers and make them very happy to be using those systems. And they said to me, well, what's the, what's the magic wand? What's the one trick, you know, that kind of BuzzFeed article title? What's the one cool trick for resolving um, these kind of problems? Uh, I say, it's not really about there being one cool trick. You've just got to apply a basic kind of scientific methodology. Take the system, measure the system, find out what that bottleneck is, fix it, and kind of iterate until you meet your business goals. No magic needed. OK. So let's have a look at um, an approach for understanding where those bottlenecks are in your system, which is uh, profiling. So what do I mean by uh, profiling? I mean profiling in the sense of uh, software. So profiling is about finding what the main consumer of a resource is finding where the bottleneck in your system is. If your system is slow, it's bottlenecked on some specific resource. It could be CPU time that you're running out of. It could be that you're waiting around talking to other systems, which is also a kind of time resource in and of itself. We'll look at the difference between CPU time, wall clock time in a little bit. It could be a bottlenecked on memory problems. It could be running out of memory, falling over, all sorts of things like that. And profiling is a way of trying to find out where that bottleneck is and tie it back directly to your 
application code and say, what's the method that's causing it? The, what are the methods of the dominant consumers of this resource? What are the lines of code? But psychologically, profiling is also a different, uh, at performing a different activity to us, as well as the kind of pragmatic idea of finding the method that's our kind of problem for uh, a certain workload or harness. And that is, it's giving us an opportunity to challenge our existing mental model with some data. Now, when we're uh, going and uh, writing code out there, we all have a mental model of how our system works, right? We all think, you know, we've got this component, it's talking to this component, and we also have often a kind of performance concept of what's going on there. This thing is doing a lot of work, this thing is the key bottleneck, but there's this fantastic uh, Mike Tyson quote, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. That's what often happens when you take these systems and put them into production. You realize that your mental model isn't necessarily right. You may not actually get punched in the face by world championship level boxer, thankfully, but things don't work as well as you'd hoped they would do. So this is what profiling gives us, a way of removing these biases and removing our uh, self-imposed mental constraints. Now, profiling is a very good thing to look at when you want to understand about tying back uses of resources back to application code and finding bottlenecks. But before we look at profiling, you probably should look at some more system-oriented metrics. So uh, this is a little bit of output from VMstat, which is a tool that's installed on loads of Linux servers. You probably don't want to use VMstat necessarily to collect your metrics, but it's a very simple installed everywhere piece of software. You probably want to have some metric monitoring system that's gathering those stats and storing them for your whole uh, server fleet somewhere. And you want to take a look at those CPU time metrics that I've got highlighted in green on the right-hand side. User time, system time, idle time, wait, that's IO wait, and steal. Okay? So user time means your CPU is busy and it's running your code. System time means your CPU is busy and it's running code inside the kernel or somewhere inside the kernel. Idle means your CPU is not doing anything. Uh, wait is time spent waiting on IO operations. And stir steal is time that another virtual machine on the same host has nabbed back off you. So if you are running on AWS micro instances or something really small like that, run VMstat1 on one of your servers for a while whilst it's doing some work. You'll see those steel stats go through the roof after a while where AWS said, right, you're out of burst. We're going to take some of our CPU back. You didn't pay for that to begin with. OK, so let's assume that uh, okay, so let's assume for the first couple of demos I'm going to look at that we've got a lot of CPU time that's in user time here. And for the second set of demos, we're doing a lot of idle or uh, wait time. And we'll see why in a sec. So I'm just going to run through um, a, start, a demo app. So this is on GitHub. Feel free to download it at home, play around practice. Um, it's just a very basic drop wizard application that's got a few performance problems in and a few load harnesses in that you can kind of play around with and see what's going on. So our first problem is something that is CPU bottlenecked. So if I just run uh, my application and start it up here, cool. We can see that what I've done here is I've imported a bunch of UK house price transaction data because in the UK everyone is obsessed with property prices, right? That's so basically the national hobby after complaining about the weather, which I don't think is going very well at the moment either. Um, so I, I've just done a quick search on the system. So I've imported them into this system. Uh, this system does a search over all those house price transactions. And so this was just searching for the ones within Cardiff. Um, and you can see that the cheapest property was like 266 pounds, which is unbelievable. Who knows what that is? And there's something super expensive down below. Anyway, you can see there's lots of transactions in there. 
Um, and in order to get that data, I just hit that drop wizard service that I had on my local host machine and said, you know, search for Cardiff and pretty printed it out. Okay, so let's just check. Everything's good. Everything's good. So I'm also going to run a quick little benchmark script. I'm not hitting the endpoint too many times because I don't want you to be sitting around waiting here all day. So what this does is it basically does the same kind of search hitting that web service repeatedly in a loop. And uh, it runs the Apache Bench tool, which is a little tool for originally for benchmarking the Apache HTTP web server. And the output of Apache Bench is this latency histogram here. OK, so what do those numbers on screen mean? Well, this means that 50% of requests that we sent to this service took 836 milliseconds or less. 90% took 1,148 milliseconds or less. And the worst case was about two seconds. OK. So two seconds is really slow. One second we've decided, or 800 milliseconds we've decided, is really slow. Let's try and um, figure out what is the problem with that system. So I've attached this uh, application to the Opsian profiler, uh, which is a hosted service that uh, runs and aggregates data, potentially from many machines, but we're just using it for one machine here. And it's outputting a visualization of profiling data called a flame graph. Um, now, don't worry, I'll zoom in on this in a sec because I'm sure you can't read any of the text in the boxes. But in this uh, visual flame graph visualization, so who's familiar with flame graphs or you used them before? Oh, wow, cool. Every time I talk about flame graphs, it seems like the number of people who are familiar with them is rising, so that's, that's good to see. The people who aren't familiar with flame graphs, don't worry, I'm going to explain what's going on here. Um, each of the boxes in this visualization corresponds to a method within your application. And the width of the boxes within the application is the amount of time that that method or its children has taken up in terms of your CPU time. And we can see at the top, if we zoom in, that the top method there is javalangthread.run. So as we go down this method, uh, uh, stack in the flame graph, the methods above methods lower down are calling them. So this is visualizing stack traces aggregated over a certain amount of time and where in the application those are. So the first thing to think about with flame graphs is even though there are a lot of big fat boxes at the top, it's not just the width of the box that you want to look at when interpreting and understanding this profiling data. The thing that's interesting when you see a flame graph is what happens in this kind of space here, where we see the graph kind of narrow in at the bottom. Because what this means is that some of these methods here are genuinely methods which have actually got work happening inside them. Methods that have high self time are methods where the method is wide and its children are narrower down here. So we can see this is doing some work and these things are doing some work. Okay. So if we just kind of zoom in in the middle here, we can see we've got a few uh, different methods that are doing some kind of fat chunks just before we start the narrowing down process or at the beginning of the narrowing down process. We've got our house resource .sales search method. So that's like the HTTP resource in a JAXRS drop wizard system. That's calling our sales query .search method. So pretty much all of its time is in there. Sales query.search has a method that it calls called get sales data, which we might think from the name should just be a simple getter, right? Should be nice and fast, but it turns out that's 74% of our time. And that getter is actually calling a method called read sales. Okay. So let's have a quick look here for the sales data class. All right, here we go. And we've got our get sales method. And we've got our read sales method here. And we can kind of see from just 
looking at this code on screen, that we've got this field, the static field that we read about and looks like we should be initializing, but actually is never assigned to. And actually what we do is every time we want to get the sales data, we reread it from the disk. So that's not what we want to be doing at all. That is not sensible or efficient. So let's initialize it on the first use. I'm also going to add the synchronize keyword here because we don't want to have a race updating that field. There are actually different approaches we could have done in order to uh, solve that problem. We could have, for example, aggressively loaded up the sales data when we first started the application, and then we could have just returned the static final field every time round. Uh, but this was, this was a choice here that we could make. So let's rerun that same benchmark on the uh, new harness. As we can see, we're immediately way, way faster, down to kind of 67 milliseconds. And we still got a few worse cases, which we'd expect because that's loading up the sales data the first time around. But most requests are much, much faster. Okay. Now, when I started this the second time, I gave it a slightly different agent ID. So we can look at the data specifically just for that agent ID. And uh, we can see what the profiling data is for the second time round. Now, the first thing that's interesting to notice here is we've also got our main method of our application suddenly appearing in the profiling data on the right hand side. So you probably can't see that very easily there, but that's our, our hello world application, not main method, which is where we started. Uh, and the reason this is is that we're looking at CPU profiling data, and actually we've cut the amount of CPU work down that we did during the benchmark, that starting the application is now a significant chunk of the CPU work. But that's fine. We don't care about that. So I'm just going to use the kind of thread group filter there to remove stuff that's not in the main drop wizard uh, thread pool. Okay. So let's go through and apply the same process. So we can see here, uh, we've still got that sales query method dot search inside our profiling data. And then we've got a bunch of Java streams code here. So streams have lazy intermediate operations and um, eagerly evaluated terminal operations. So if you ever see Java streams code or anything that's using that kind of fluent API style, you'll often see the final method in your streams pipeline be the top one in your stack trace. So here it is reference pipeline.collect because it was a collector at the end of the stream. Um, now the streams code spend most of its time flipping back into application code, calling this Lambda expression. So that's a Lambda expression in the method called search in the sales query class. And that spends most of its time doing a contains ignore case. And that contains ignore case spends most of its time doing two uppercase. So what on earth is going on there? Well, we can see that we've got an exceedingly inefficient implementation of a contains ignore case here. Who's seen code that looks like this before in their lives? If you're not putting your hand up now, what are you doing? Are you really a developer? Um, yeah, often a lot of problems look like this. Now, thankfully, we have this convenient um, Apache Commons library that has a string utils class that has a contains ignore case uh, method on here. So if I uh, use that library function and restart the application, recompile, rebuild, and uh, rerun it, then hopefully, right, there's a nice library function. It should be way faster. Rerun the benchmark harness. Well, it's a little bit faster. We've got down to 54 milliseconds in the 50th percentile, and some of these guys are a wee bit faster than before. Yeah, it wasn't a hugely exciting improvement. So let's go back and take a look in our profiler and see what has gone on in terms of the actual time that's being used. Well, we're still doing contains ignore case, and that's still the big bottleneck. And it's still the string utils class, so it's not moved. But it turns out that this contains ignore case in the string utils class is actually not that much faster than doing it the really dumb, simple way. 
And this is sometimes a scenario people hit when they profile applications. You find a bottleneck, you iterate on that code or improve the bottleneck, and then you rerun the profiler and say what's happening here, and it still tells you the bottleneck's in roughly the same place. Now, that doesn't mean your profile is broken, or um, it might mean it's time to go home and have a coffee rather than carry on coding that day, but sometimes this happens. It can be a bit frustrating. What do we deal with it? Well, sometimes you need to think about uh, making things a little bit more efficient in this case, or rewriting, changing the bigger picture structure of an application. Sometimes you might want to rethink what exactly is this code doing? Is it just doing something that's a bit more complicated than it really needs to? Well, it turns out that if we actually looked at that input data in the CSV file, what we'd find is every single one of these strings that we're comparing to is actually uppercase to begin with. Okay? So, with that added bit of domain knowledge, we can just simplify this whole process entirely. So, uh, let's take that query string, make it its uppercase equivalent. Oh, dangerous if I could type. Use that here. Simply change this around to being uh, is the field contained in the query string. And in fact, we could just inline that method entirely. Okay, so simplifying things down massively, how does it perform? Way faster, we're down to 22 milliseconds, massive improvement um, in the order of 40 times faster than where we started this, this experiment with. Okay, so that was a kind of simple kind of CPU bottleneck. That's where people think profilers are most commonly useful as uh, a source of information in their production system. You know that you're bottlenecked on some CPU time. It'll tell you where that CPU time is. But actually, a lot of bottlenecks that people experience in production systems tend to not necessarily be CPU-bound workloads, right? Not everyone is doing com super expensive computation or even the string comparison like that. Often you're looking at things like locks, you're looking at external systems, you're looking at all sorts of stuff like that. So, how do we, t how do we understand those kind of more blocking bottlenecks? Well, I'm going to take another very, very simple demo here. Um, it is the kind of <laughs> minimal sort of uh, SOA type application or something where we've just got two different services, one talking to another, and we'll get a kind of feel of what those kind of problems look like. So in our um, system, we've got some legacy bank service that's got a load of bank account details for a bunch of our customers. We've got our demo application, and we want to merge together some data about those different systems. So let me just check that our legacy bank system is there. Lovely. Get that running in the background. I'm just going to restart this with a different number so we can look at this uh, profiling data separately very easily. Um, and what our merge script is going to do is it's going to run in parallel for a few different users, kind of repeatedly merging in and looking at this external system. Uh, that I've got running on the system on my machine locally. Now that external system, as it turns out, has an artificial performance pathology in it, which is the fact I've just made it sleep for a while. <laughs> so very very simple. But what we're interested in doing is seeing what that looks like in terms of our profiling view and seeing uh, what it looks like from our front system that's talking over a network connection to that other system is. So it took us. 30 seconds just about to run. I'm just going to remove that other benchmark and run it. We can sort of see 
this profiling view here, which is the same profiling view that we looked at beforehand. And it's not very exciting. Everything's quite kind of square and boxy. And the reason it's all quite kind of square and boxy is there aren't many samples there. And there aren't many samples there because this benchmark didn't do very much CPU work. If we looked at the metrics on the box as we were running it, we would see it's idle most of the time, or at least this application is idle most of the time. And that kind of comes to how we think about time in terms of our application. So the benchmark I looked at just before was profiling based upon CPU time. So that's time that you're actually executing code on CPU that's weighted by. So that's an accurate view of what your application code is doing when it's busy. It's ignoring threads that are sleeping, waiting, sitting there blocked on a lock, stuff like that. And we want to see systems that are not so busy. So we also want to have a look at the wall clock profiling view here. Now, the wall clock profiling view immediately looks a lot different. Uh, we can kind of see down here, and we've got a big point. Remember I was saying earlier we want to look at the point in flame graphs where we narrow in? That is a flame graph point where we narrow in quite a lot. So what is the method just before we narrow in? Well, it's bank.merge balance from legacy bank account. OK, that makes sense. That's what we were doing. We were merging in some uh, data from a legacy system. And we can see underneath it, we've got this single child method that is dominant enough to point out in the profiling data, which is our legacy bank proxy dot get bank balance. OK, but we can see from this profiling view, the fact we get the big narrowing in that we're really waiting on something within that merge balance from legacy bank account method to begin with. So, what have we got here? We've got a very innocent looking method. This, this is kind of sitting there smiling at you, blinking its eyes, looking very nice, not looking evil at all. This is not the kind of method that you would think would have a lot of self time, right? It doesn't have a big loop in it, it's not doing any computational work, it's not doing anything very fancy. Um, all it's doing is talking to an external service for a bank account and doing these three lines of code here, which just deposit some money in your bank balance and save that object. But we know it can't be any of those things there, right? Like this method appeared in our profiling data, but it was only about 25% of the time. These three things here, even though you might immediately look at this method and go, well, it must be a database bottleneck. These were so fast, they didn't even appear in our profiling view. So they're not the problem. So what's the problem? It's this big, fat, synchronized block at the top, right? We've got different threads, and the threads are uh, coming into our system, responding to HTTP requests. They hit this synchronized block, and then they all contend on this one lock. So what is transfer lock? Transfer lock is a single, big, global lock in this system. And it's a single, big, global lock because that was an easy way of getting the uh, bank account deposits to result in the correct bank balances for different customers, right? They do one bank trans transfer at a time. You hold the lock whilst you're doing the transfer. Things are nice and simple, but not terribly performant, it turns out, right? Because you can only do one of these operations at a time. Now, I've got a convenient get lock method here, which has a lock per customer. A very, very simple uh, system here. It's just keeping a hash map from customer ID onto the locks. And then it just looks them up. And we can synchronize on that object itself. Um, that gives you a very fine-grained locking strategy. So only one thread is modifying one customer's bank balance. But you can have as many running as you have different customers. You might have other locking strategies here, like stripe locks, where you stripe up some data into a certain number of threads. You might batch customers into those stripes, all sorts of different things. But that is a very simple way of uh, looking at, us, at it that's going to get us a nice fine-grained locking strategy and hopefully resolve the concurrency bottleneck that our profiler was telling us about. So if I rerun the merge script,
the more you uh, don't have to wait 30 seconds this time. It's only uh, eight, eight and a half, nine seconds there this time around. So what does this look like in terms of our profiling view? Well, it's a big fat box. What is this big fat box telling us? Back where we were last time was in that merge balance, merge balance from legacy bank account method. This one here was before we had the big squeeze in self time. Okay, but here this is pretty much flat. Very, very bottlenecked. Going through our legacy bank proxy dot get bank balance method all the way down. Now you might say to me, well, Richard, there's nowhere on this flame graph that it narrows. Well, here it kind of narrows to nothing, if you see what I mean, at the bottom of the flame graph. What is the method at the bottom of the flame graph? Socket input stream dot socket read zero. Okay? So what we're bottlenecked on is waiting on reading data from another system. If you war clock profile uh, a lot of systems, as, as we do at Opsian, as I've done as a consultant before, you'll frequently find things like socket input stream dot socket read zero plop up as bottlenecks in profiling data. And what it means is you're waiting on some external system that you need to go and figure out. Now here, we can tell what that external system is because we've got that legacy bank proxy dot get bank balance method. If you were trying to find out what that external system is, you would need to find back the line of code that is above this socket read zero going into your code base. And then you can look at that code and say, that is the line that's initiating this external communication. And it may not be an HTTP request. It might be something like a database connection. Frequently, you can see SQL database connections. Now, if we wanted to spend all day on benchmarks, we would apply the same methodology to our external system, the legacy bank balance, that um, we have done here. Optimize, tune, improve it, and then rerun things. But for now, I'm just going to add one as a command line argument. So that is my equivalent of the blue Peter. Here's one I made earlier, cake. And that will basically make that external system go vastly faster. And we'll be able to see what's going on here. And this time merging it through was just over a second. So we went down from 27.9 seconds to 1.4. OK. Cool. So that was the second profiling demo. But what I've shown you here is basically profiling a single application and finding bottlenecks on my laptop in a conference talk. That's not the real world as much as I would love to tell you it is. Okay? So how do we bridge the gap between looking at these things as an isolated load harness thing on a single machine with solving real problems? Well, now I'm going to go through a series of problems that you'll find that kind of constitute that gap and talk about how we can solve each one of them in turn. The first one is being representative in terms of your system. So there are three parts to problem one. The first part of that is a representative workload. I had a few simple benchmark scripts on my laptop that exercise some things on this demo application. In practice, if you want to apply that same performance testing thing, you need to have really, really accurate performance tests that behave in exactly the same way as your customers, if you want to take that approach. But that's really hard to do. I know organizations that have whole teams of performance engineers working full time, and you can never, ever get everything perfectly right. Performance testing is you know, a thankless, never-ending job. As people, as your customers change their behavior, that can change your workload. As the application's refactored or as the website design changes, things like that, that can change your workload. If you're looking on machine to machine type problems, if you get, say, for example, if you work in capital markets, you might find the flow of trading patterns throughout the day changes uh, over time, and that changes your performance problems. It's really, really difficult to be representative. 
The second problem is getting representative hardware. Okay, so my laptop does not look the same as a production environment. Who here has the exact same hardware in a QA lab, exact same hardware as they run in production somewhere? One, two, three, four, five. I know Martin's putting his hands up because he's using a, a cloud platform. That's the, the cheating way to get accurate hardware. But yes, that, is, that does count. Cool, there are a few people, but mostly what your development environment is is very different from your production system. So, and things can behave differently. It's not just a matter of your production system is faster. You need to have the same kind of bottlenecks. If you have a laptop with a much, much slower CPU than some production server, but you have a nice fast NVMe disk because you just bought a new laptop three months ago, but you last upgraded your production hardware two years ago and it's still running, spinning rust or a previous uh, generation SSD, the ratio of those things can be quite different. They can change CPU bottlenecks into disk IO bottlenecks or uh, otherwise. Problem number three, part number three of problem one being representative is the operating system that you use. Who uses the exact same software configuration on their laptop down to operating system, JVM version, every single thing as they have in their production environment? Who uses Mac OS in their development environment and Linux in production? That's loads of people, isn't it? Who uses Windows in their development environment and Linux in production? Who uses Windows in production and Linux in their development environment? I didn't think there was anyone, but I, I'm going to keep on asking anyway. I'd love to meet that guy when I find them. Um, not only is it a matter of having different operating systems that have different schedulers, different uh, threading library implementations that the JVM might use once they've coarsened locks, it's also a matter of having the same correct version and tuning setup of that same operating system. So back in um, was it May 2015, when the kind of uh, the in a regular Patch Tuesday update, uh, Microsoft released a patch in result of a Spectre meltdown mitigation that slowed down UDP throughput by 40% on a regular Patch Tuesday security update. Sometimes there can be huge differences for things like this, and Spectrum meltdown. You know, I know there was a whole bunch of patches that came out last year, but it's an ongoing mitigation process. Lots of version-specific things. So we've said you could have the same hardware, the same software, and a perfect workload, and we could put a lot of money and time in getting those things right. For some organizations, that might be a good choice. A better solution is just measure what your actual production system is doing, measure what your actual production workload is doing. Your real system, using your real data, I didn't even really talk about data here, but different data sets can obviously perf cause performance problems to change quite a lot, especially around things like caching behavior and stuff like that, um, and a real workload, okay? Have the measurement on the actual production system. Now, in order to achieve that, you need very low overhead profilers. So aside from Opsin, uh, which is a very low overhead continuous profiler, there's a few, some of these are open source, a few very low overhead ad hoc production profilers. So by ad hoc, I mean something you can kind of connect up to pr production once in a while and look at some of the data it comes out of. I'll explain why ad hoc is probably undesirable as well, but it's always good to mention some of the open source tooling as well. Problem number two, intermittent issues. What I showed on my laptop was a performance problem, a workload that I could just go up, enter in a shell and reproduce. In practice, performance problems are very rarely that easy to reproduce or that simple, right? Often, you get performance problems when you're hitting capacity, when you trigger a burst, okay? If anyone works in capital markets, you often find bursts are very fast, a few hundred milliseconds uh, periodically here and there. If you work in, say, betting markets, you often find bursts of traffic on things like uh, Cheltenham races can often be a big time of year for things like that, or e-commerce often have big traffic workloads around uh, Black Friday and big sale deals, right? These are rare issues, weekly, monthly, annual, periodic things that you can't necessarily get, uh, uh, you can't necessarily reproduce and are very hard to see. So timing related problems. How do you solve that problem? Well, continuous profiling. 
So continuous profiling doesn't just mean always having your profiler switched on on a production system. It means you retain the historical data that you see from that system. And that allows you to engage in retroactive po post hoc analysis of an event. You had a big sale day, you've captured the profiling data, you've captured that measurement, and the following week you can evaluate what was the bottleneck, fix that problem. So the next time your website does a big sale day, you don't hit the same problem. Okay? It also enables comparisons between things. Uh, we, for example, have a way in our UI that you can do diffs for the profiling data between different releases. That's the kind of thing that you can only do if you've got continuous profiling data. Problem three, infrequently used code. So in my demo, I uh, was able to just load test a specific bit of my application in an isolated environment. In the real world, things are way, way noisier than that. It might be that the thing that's the big dominant consumer is also your bottleneck, but you also might have a latency sensitive part of your system that's infrequently used. So the most common example for that for people's websites is their sign-up process. If you've got a really bad sign-up process, you won't be acquiring new customers, right? And if you're spending a lot of money on acquiring those customers, that's a very bad thing for your business. But customers signing up to your website is rarely a very big part of the load that your system takes. So kind of traditional profiling, where you're just trying to find the dominant consumer of a resource across a whole application, is very unlikely to find bottlenecks that are in things like sign-up processes, even though they might be valuable code. So how do you solve that problem? Once you've got that historical data that you've aggregated and stored, you want to be able to query that data, slice it, dice it, filter those profiles. Once you've got things like filtering by methods and threads over that historical data, you can very easily narrow down that historical data to look at just profiling stack traces that were related to your logon or your sign-up process or things like that. And if it's an infrequent thing, Continuous profiling means you get enough data points to have a statistically significant sample size. Then there's kind of problems four and five, which are related to access and scale. Chinese walls exist within an organization. Who's a developer who has access to their production system and can install software and change stuff? That's some people who can't do anything on their production system. That's also some people. Some organizations have legal requirements to keep these two different groups of people uh, separate, very challenging. And also, how do you apply these things to whole fleets of machines? It's very rare that people have a system that just runs on one machine. You want to think about how your bottleneck applies across your whole fleet. And the answer to that is about decoupling away the profiling system itself from visualizations, not taking a traditional desktop profiler approach where you connect to one machine, read a log, and spew it out. Take that data, put it in an aggregation system, and then view the results elsewhere. That way you can have these systems set up in advance, and your developers can have access to the data without having to go onto the box and, at a critical time for your system, when it's under load, trying to connect in some profiling tooling at that point in time. OK, conclusions. Firstly, I think it's, there's so much great work that's gone on in the kind of JVM ecosystem and community for improving profiling data as well. These people have all done some absolutely fantastic work in kind of improving the accuracy and reducing the overhead of systems out there some of them for open source work, and things like people like Brendan Gregg for kind of coming up with a flame graph visualization, which is a, a fantastic tool. And just restate, to begin with, what our objectives were with fantastic performance. Happy technical and business, happy users, so getting a responsive and reliable system that doesn't leave people waiting for ages for their pages to load. Cheaper infrastructure, improving efficiency there. Happier accountants, that's what I like to to think, to think of it. Uh, my mum's an accountant, so maybe I have a, a more positive view of accountants than most people, but who knows. Um, and then uh, scalability, happier uh, uh, venture capitalists or senior management who've got these big scale-out goals for your business, got growth as an objective. Can you achieve that growth from a technical point of view 
Yes, we can. So, some a few simple profiling takeaways, aside from all the kind of stuff we talked about with applying real-world stuff. Thinking about using CPU time-based profiling when you want to see what your system's actually doing on CPU when you're actually uh, CPU bottlenecked or under heavy load. War clock time profiling when you see less CPU load or when you're blocking on external systems like databases and microservices. Uh, looking on flame graphs where the flame graphs kind of narrow in within the stack trace where you see a lot of self time and then looking within those stack traces because you often find what's using up time is a library looking up from that library to see what was the last point in your application code what and caused this bit of work to happen and things like socket tail nodes they're always you reading or writing to an external system Maybe files, if it's not a socket, but say a stream, but a file, a file stream reader. Uh, and again, it runs as external services. That could be databases as well as JVM services. Cool. What we've talked about today is a kind of a data-driven optimization of removing dominant consumers of resources. Um, it's not a very sexy uh, name, I must admit, but it is definitely a really good approach, a solid time-tested methodology for solving problems that you might have in your system. And yeah, I, I thought I'd just put this picture up at the end. You know, performance problems, fixing performance problems, and improving performance in your system. You know, people often talk about it like it's taming a mythical beast, or like it involves the incantation of some magic words like reactive and cloud native. But in practice, that's not what you need to do. You need to just be thinking methodol methodically, scientifically, and in a kind of data-driven empirical process, and you'll get useful results that will be really beneficial for you and your team and your business. Okay. Thank you very much. That's the end of the talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, now is a great time to answer them. I've got a couple of minutes, so I can probably do one or two questions. <laughs>